people from the neighborhood come by. So Miller said, and I don't see him, so I can't do that. He said, what can you do? <laughs> you can say that you can't do something, we know that. <laughs> but we've got to go further. All right. I wrote him a letter, thanked him, and I did what he told me to do, which is, if I remember the neighborhood, he didn't tell me to write. So I, I went down to New York nervously, uh, and I called, and I spoke to Mrs. Williams, who identified herself, this is Flossie. I explained who I was, she said, yes, Bill told me about you. Oh, this is a big boost. I'm somebody, <laughs> finally. This is out of Kierkegaard. The rotation, I was noticed. And I had some, somehow life had meaning. So the long and short of it was that I took a bus and I got over there, over here, to Rutherford. She, Flossie, had me sit down and she asked me if I wanted some coffee or tea, and I was not saying no. She said, and then she, I'll never forget the way she put it. She said, I know you'll have some ginger ale, which really got to me, because I did love ginger ale. And maybe Eric Erickson once said to me, she was addressing the nice young growing boy, <laughs> instead of the grown up who drinks things like coffee and tea. So, he was getting a little shrinky about it, but it was true. I took the ginger ale and slurped it down, so I had another one. And then he came in and, oh, he said, it's you. So he said, come on, I have some work to do. And he asked me to come along with him. I got in that car, clutch, no, no gears. A gear shift coming out of the uh, where the steering is, but from the floor, I remember the stick and that hand moving that and the leg pumping the clutch. And we started out. And as we started out, he was constantly looking and looking and looking to the point. And I began to think we were going to get into an accident. He noticed this and he noticed that. And he noticed who was on the street. And he saw from a distance at one point some chalk mark on the sidewalk. I'll never forget it. He stopped the car to show me what the kids had done to play hopscotch. He said, you know hopscotch? I didn't know what he was talking about. He was about ready to play hopscotch with me. You lift up your leg and you jump. Uh, it's that kind of experience that I had getting to know him and going around Tom Romer wonderfully, wonderfully with his camera has taken us back to this world. The world within a world that he knew and explored his eyes moving constantly. He once told me later that he originally wanted to be a painter. Vision was everything to him. Seeing. He had made a wonderful photographer and a wonderful artist. It so happens that my mother was interested in art and collecting things. And she was interested in Kathy Colwitz. Kathy Colwitz's artwork is right in the tradition of Williams and what he was about, the ordinary and poor people and their struggles for the world, which he rendered on a canvas, drawing and sketching, and sometimes painting. He knew Colwitz. He also knew Ed, who was Harper, over there, up there in New York. I had taken courses in fine arts, no Harper. I don't want to badmouth a great institution, but you know I'm putting us in the perspective of the middle of the last century, with a kind of, to use a, uh, a word that could be even called a disease if you want it, but let's not get into that. Anglophilia of a certain kind, which the British probably would laugh at. It's unfair to England. And some of the great writers the country obviously is, continues to produce. I remember hearing Spender speak when I was a student. There was a humility to him that 
he had been elevated because he was an English poet by some of those teachers. I'm going into these detours, but as you notice, they're all the same road. Anyway, those trips, those streets, those individuals, going into the houses, hearing him and seeing him, and then deciding to try to go into medicine. I hated those pre-medical courses. I never did well in all that stuff. And when I, I'm, <laughs> I'll never forget, I was taking organic chemistry, and I told him that I prepared something called triphenylcarbonyl. It was driving me out of my mind. The fact that I still remember the name triphenylcarbonyl, well, why do I remember it? He was clever enough to figure it out. He said, something happened that pushed that into your head. Not being shrinky. I said, Doctor, for a week I was preparing this stuff called triphenylcarbonyl. I still remember it was experiment number 11. <laughs> I got down, and there were two layers in the beaker. I poured one down the drain, a big mistake. You never, you don't pour anything down the drain. You separate them and then figure out which one you want. But I poured the gist of it is the wrong one down the drain. And there was a teacher there who now is a professor of chemistry <coughs> who started laughing. And he said, you're going to have to start all over again. But he was laughing. And that triggered off something in my head. And I, as we say now, lost it. I picked up the empty beaker. I've told my classes this for years. And I smashed it on the floor of the lab. And I walked out of the lab. Bill Regan, I still remember his name, who's now an ophthalmologist, retired. He came up. And he said, we got to go back and apologize. I use two words. I think you know what they are, <laughs> referring to that teacher. The F-U expression, <laughs> exclamation mark. I went back and I told Perry Miller this. And I'll never forget in that fancy wideness study, he said, I'll be damned. He picked up the phone to call up Louis Fieser, who was a professor, and we used Fieser and Fieser's book. He said, Louis, i got to tell you something. And he told him. Fieser told him to send me over to his office. I, this is a part of the Mallinckrodt Chemistry Lab that I didn't even know existed. But there I was in his office. And a Harvard professor, he apologized to me. I told Williams that once, and I'll never forget the way he put it. He said, you know, though, and he wasn't explicitly religious and often anti-religious, but he said, you know, if there is a God, that God works in strange ways. And maybe this is that God's way of coming to you and telling you to have a sense of humor, and the way he added it, about a lot of crap. <laughs> so I tried to have a sense of humor about a lot of crap and continue. <laughs> Meanwhile, he told me that he didn't have to take any of that crap because he could go then. Uh, the way he put it very eloquently, he said, you know, in my day, we didn't have to go to college to become a doctor. We didn't have to take pre-med courses. We went from a school to a place called medical school. I said, my God. He said, you know, there are advantages to be an old, tired guy. He didn't look tired to me, but he was basically teaching me in an Eric Erickson way about generations and possibilities. There was a lot going on there that Williams was always coming forth with. And then I finally learned to understand this as I listened and wrote. And he told me, he said, if you want to remember some of this, you can write it down. We didn't, I didn't have a tape recorder. I don't think they existed then. But I wrote and remembered. And I went to see Yale Neyland, who at Columbia Medical School used to mention Chekhov and Tolstoy. 
and who knew of Dr. Williams. And I went to see him, and at that time I was ready to pull out. And we talked, and he said, look, you go to New Jersey and keep seeing that doctor there. He's as important for you to see as any doctor in this fancy, he called it, medical center. So I did. You see how we all need colleagues, co-conspirators, whatever imagery you want to come up with. I told Williams about that. And I'm telling you the way he spoke to me. He said, look, young man, he'd say sometimes to me, look, young man, we find friends in this world. We meet others. That's the way. It doesn't have to be in some fancy classroom, in some fancy institution. This is the kind of language I heard in that car. I also, in that car, saw him seeing, constantly, noticing. Sometimes he'd grab a prescription pass there. I've got to remember that. What he meant is not words that he heard, but a sight, a moment of vision. So I guess he taught me to look. And he sometimes would ask children to draw some pictures for him because he wanted to bring out the artist in them. Later, when I started working with children, I started doing that, remembering what he told me. And people used to say, why are you always getting people, children to draw pictures? I thought, my God. A doctor once told me that in drawing a picture, a child shows you the world, that the child wants you to notice, 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 notice. So I started doing that, much to my publisher's dismay, eventually, because it adds to the cost of a book, they tell you. Anyway, the drawings, the drawings. This started before I went south and stumbled into the children going through school desegregation, which came after Williams. But before that, when I was in medical school, we had a polio epidemic. Remember before the salt vaccine? And I admitted a couple of those kids to the hospital. I got involved with some of those kids, and I'll never forget one of those kids who was now paralyzed from the waist down looked at me and said, Doctor, I'm worried about you. You're working too hard, and you look tired. I told Williams that. He shook his head when I met him, and I told him, he said, you see, who is healing whom? Who is teaching whom? These are the questions we have to ask all the time of ourselves, whether we become, as he put it, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, was the way he sometimes had him uh, putting it. Doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. So there was a huge privilege to get to know him, to be inspired by him, to follow him around in that car and see some of the people. He'd, get on the, he'd sit on the floor with the kids. Now, the, the parents wanted him to sit at a table. They apologized. He wanted to be on the floor with the kids. He'd cross his legs. He'd bend down. He had a little bit of sciatica, which I would later know what it means to have. But on the floor, he had crayons. And he had an ear and those eyes all the time at work. And then the, the writing he did when he got out of the house before he started the car. Sometimes he'd start the car, he'd put the gear in neutral, and the, the motor would just run. I would think of my father saying, you're wasting gas. But he let that motor go. And then he was, if you want to get fancy about it, but it's important to put it this way these days. He was 
if I may say so, doing documentary work. He was a photographer and a writer at work. The photographer's eyes, the writer's listening, remembering, and watching eyes, brain, words, pictures, together, a view of things, a sense of things, a glimpse, visual words. There it was, and me trying to find my life. And now I'll skip over to how I ended up doing the doctor stories, because one of the people he knew, of course, who published them was Jay Lachlan. Jay Lachlan, whose son actually, uh, for a while, had some troubles and uh, took one of my courses. Talk about life. Jay Lachlan, who was a friend of James Agee, and very close, of course, to Dr. Williams. In fact, once Williams was talking about Jay Lachlan, he said, young man, he'd say to me, we're driving. Have you ever heard of Jones and Lachlan? I thought he was talking about a law firm or a doctor's firm or something. Jones and Lachlan, big steel, lots of dough. That's the way he talked, not money, but lots of dough, big steel. So I said, yeah, I thought I'd better go home and read the Wall Street Journal or something at this rate. But Lachlan, the Jones and Lachlan, one of them, had moved from that, which intrigued Williams enormously, to being a publisher. Eventually, when I met Jay Lachlan, and I live in Concord, Massachusetts, he told me that he had a relative who lived in Concord such a moving story. He said he's a big shot. He has a big fancy home. You should go over and see him. I said, well, I don't want to go and drop it on people. He said, I'm going to call him up and go and see him. Well, I saw a little of the consequences of Jones and Lachlan. Concord is not an immodest town anyway. But, uh, it's a big shot place these days with all the computers, whatever the hell has happened to all of us. But anyways, Jones and Locke, in a way, you see what Lachlan was telling me. You want to understand some of what Williams was about. You see, Williams used to call them fat cats. And you understand now he was, in his own way, a kind of populist, not in a political way. No, no, no. In fact, Oh, I'm a little embarrassed, and Roosevelt was a hero to my, not both my parents, but one of them. But he made remarks about Roosevelt that I found not nice. Big shots up in Hyde Park, you see that kind of stuff that was there, which he then knew he shouldn't say. It was some kind of inflammation or vitriol that he had to get off his chest. When I was having my head shrunk, as we do in my profession. My analyst made that comment. It got me really, if you pardon the expression, pissed off. But nevertheless, he had a point. He had a point about Williams. That, you know, frustrations, a kind of populist identification, but at the same time, one leg in the upper reaches of new directions and Harvard and Yale and Columbia and all that jazzeroony, and another, the ordinary country dog or city dog, trying to work with some people and learn from them and see them and let them be his teachers so that he can write about them and then taking up the big shots. Uh, no ideas, but in things. There's an assault. <laughs> on in the library, I guess, and other such places. No ideas but in things. Perry Miller said to me, I'll never forget, a college student then, he said, this is, those words are a declaration of war. War? I didn't have the guts to say, what do you mean war? But he explained, he went on. Thank God for him, he changed my life. Like the fact that I'm right here now and that I went to medicine, whatever, but he said, uh, 
That is saying to people who have a lot of ideas that there is this world around us of which we are a part, that we respect, that we connect to. I, the thou being the world, and whatever. Williams had, you know, despite an anti-religious side, especially directed institutionally, he knew writing when it was good, and he knew parts of the Bible. And I'll never forget the way he put it about, he said, look what happened to that rabbi. He took on the big shocks. Look what they did to him. You take on the big shots, you get into trouble. You can get into trouble in a school if you take on the big shots. You have to learn how to obey. And then he said, and then that ugly word, conform. Then they'll confirm you if you conform. I remember him playing with that. Ugh, confirm, conform. I said, get me out of here. Let me go back to that damn school and get by. Confirm, conform. I'm ranting and raving now in a way I can feel him in me. I go near Nine Ridge, as he put it, not Road, just Nine Ridge. I can feel him in the house. I can see Flossie sitting there. I can hear him talking about his sons. And then when Jay Laughlin talked about a life-changing event, said, Bob, we got to take some of those doctor stories, we can call them doctor stories, and pull them together. Because there he is, a big, big part of him. So he got me going, and going over that stuff, and remembering him, and reading those stories, will sort of bring him alive again, which is what happened to me, experiencing, reading, remembering, trying to convey, and on and on we go. In any event, it's a privilege to be here again. Thank you all for what you're doing. 125 years ago he was born. God bless his memory, and thank you all. so that you can come and tell me because, you know, I'm over 21 and some of my hearing is just as it used to be when I was five. Okay, we're going to turn up the lights and Michael is going to uh, ask some questions for us. Okay. Yeah. Great. Maybe we can uh, we just have some people. We'll... <laughs> and then we'll have people in the audience, if you would. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Coles, I guess they're great. Or you have to tell them to go without. <laughs> You know, one of the words, actually, when Williams was losing his hearing, as I am now to some extent, he would say, you know what I love about losing my hearing? I can say to people, A, <laughs> and they look at me, and then he says, again, A, and then they get it. <laughs> wow, talk about, can you, only he could pull that off that way. Oh, uh, E-H, exclamation mark, A. <laughs> I thought he meant A as an A, B, C, D, but then I realized there he was, drawing from the strength of ordinary language and not getting fancy about it, not getting <coughs> medical about it, just saying A, question mark, and maybe exclamation mark. He loved those exclamation marks. Oh, did he, and those dashes when he'd write and break things up that way. Then he once said to me, he said, did they ever teach you a semicolon back there? I said, well, actually, my father did. My father came from England, and he was always conscious of semicolons. He said, you know, that's a snobby punctuation. 
but he said it has a very good purpose, <laughs> redeeming my father and the mark. But he occasionally would be tempted, but then he used a dash. Sometimes Fossey said he used a semicolon and then he'd laugh, but it's a whole story. Even a semi, even a punctuation mark is loaded with, with class privilege <laughs> and God knows what else. But there it was. Uh, yeah, Here's a question. Uh, Bill, do you have a question? Thanks a lot for coming. Do, do you still see a, a resistance among the academics to Williams? And I'm thinking in particular of one of your colleagues, a woman named Helen Bendler, who doesn't have, seem to have a lot to say about Williams. Is there an academic resistance? Now. 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 Did Williams have a certain resistance no, even now? Even now. Is it still, do they still resist oh, is this in academia? A res among students? Faculty. faculty. The faculty? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Helen no, no, no. I don't see that resistance yeah. to academics in the faculty. Perry Miller was very unusual. And I don't see the likes of Perry Miller floating around. The answer is no. I wish there were more Perry Millers. Actually, I wrote about something, and I dedicated a book to Perry Miller. And his wife, talk about a long circle, she wrote me a letter. And she asked to see me. Uh, and she said, you know, Perry had a lot of trouble. You wouldn't know this as a student. But she told me what Williams knew in his bones, that he was taking on power. And he was a Midwesterner from Chicago, came from the outside, an unconventional person. And it was a difficult time. And the person who also told me this at some length uh, in his own way was Williams talking about Ivy League schools. You know, when I was an intern at the University of Chicago clinics, this is in the 1950s, he came and spoke. He was older, but he came and spoke. And he was toward the end. But I'll never forget, we were in there, I think it's the Rockefeller Chapel, if I remember correctly, on the midway. But he waved his arms around, and he said, I hope all this stuff doesn't get in the way of of God. Get in the way of God. <laughs> Boy, in one statement, he could tear down so much and build up so much. But I still remember that moment. Get in the way of God. Look, these places, they have their own life and wonderful moments. But uh, it can be tough sometimes for some people students and teachers alike. Other questions? Okay, um, I'm coming at it from a, a layman's perspective, from someone who's not a scholar and very well studied on William Carlos Williams. Why is there, or has there been, academic resistance to, to Williams and his work? And why is he so important in the lineage of American poetry? Can you just repeat it, Monica? Just say it. Monica, you, could you? Just say it. Williams and academics, frankly, I try to, when I use that word, anglophilia, he was an American poet and an essayist and storyteller, writing about ordinary folks at a time when that wasn't, that everyone was looking up, as I said, to TSO and people like that. And they just, and he was combatively in his own way, let's be fair about it, he was combatively against high class privilege, including in the academic world. So I think uh, there was some justification for those people who felt that this guy was, you know, a scrappy character who was concerned about people that they weren't concerned with. Let's face it, let's be blunt about it. The documentary tradition, let's move over to photography. That didn't originate in the Ivy League either. <laughs> the documentary tradition, you know, where did it come from? Well, there was Roosevelt and the FSA, 
and there were certain wonderful photographers who had who did what they did, but you weren't seeing that, you know, in the department, the fine arts department. I talk about that's not the only the English department. I took three <coughs> courses in fine arts. Not once was Edward Harper brought up. We learned how to say ang, I-N-G-R-E-S. <laughs>